And this morning, I feel led to challenge with you a, uh, a message that has been on my heart heavily for this year. And it started out um, in my own quiet time, and then it, it broadened out into the time with the pastors, and then from the pastors to all of our office staff, and then all of our office staff to our pastors and deacons together on the retreat. So there's a few people that have heard this a few times this week, and, but not an entirety. So um, those of you who've heard it, Pastor Jason, stay awake. Um, it's not over yet. So um, in fact, there's some different things here that I believe are very important. But God, I can't escape the fact that God has laid this passage of Scripture on my heart for us, and not only for us corporately, but for you personally. As I think about all of the individual lives in this room, as I think about all of the different people from young to the more mature, from those with little responsibility to those with much responsibility, I think about the glorious nature of this calling that God has given us. And I think about some in this room this morning who have never truly come to Christ. You've been coming, you've been listening, you've been looking, you've been hearing, maybe for a short time, maybe for a long time. And I want you to know that this message is for you too. And even though it aims directly and squarely at the heart of Christians in it, and at some of our greatest struggles, even as Christians, that there's a message of God's great redemption here that we begin to see it. And we see it from the book of Ephesians. And in fact, I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to Ephesians. Even though there's a text that is here, I hope that you have a Bible open because I want to start with Ephesians 1 and very quickly. First of all, I'd like to ask you to do a little bit of research right now. It's very quick research, but do you have the book of Ephesians? In fact, get a few pages there, Ephesians. And, um, and how many pages is it there? It's probably only about three or four pages in your Bible. Do you see the beginning of Ephesians and the end of Ephesians? Ephesians? Do you see that? Do you have that? How many chapters make up the book of Ephesians? There are six chapters in the book of Ephesians. And um, I, I, we're going we're gonna to look at this and review this a little bit. Secondly, I want you to look at the screen in front of you. The screen in front of you is a picture um, of one of the areas of the Alps near Albertville, France. In fact, um, when I was, um, when Marcy and I and the girls moved to France, if, as we were headed to Africa, you have to learn to speak French before you can move to most areas of Africa. So we went to a Christian missionary language school in Albertville, France. And you say, well, that sounds so glorious. Yeah, but you've never been in language school before, uh, where they actually expect you to learn the language. Some of you did it in college where, eh, you know, whatever, this is fun. Well, in this language school, it was very serious, um, and it was a lot of hard work. In fact, I had never drank co drunk coffee before in my life until I went to language school as a 30-year-old. I started drinking coffee because um, uh, it, was, it was hard work. But they put us in little houses all around the valley, and um, this, this next picture shows our little dinner table. Um, and it was beautiful. I mean, you, you open up the little doors on our little apartment that was there, and you look out across the table, out across the trees in the yard to um, a, a line of mountain ridges that were there. And I looked out there time and time again, and I would just start thinking, man, I've got to get up on that mountain. I've got to climb that thing. Um, and uh, in fact, here's just to give you a little bit of perspective, there's Cheryl and Andrea on their very first day of first grade. Um, so there they are going off to school together. But that ridge line, that ridge line um, was something that I desired to, to climb. And so um, a few of us got together and uh, we made a plan. We waited for good weather and we climbed um, that ridge line uh, about 7,000, 8,000 feet above the valley and uh, very, very high on the top. And there's a little path that runs along that ridge line. And it's a couple thousand foot drop on each side. A um, few different places where um, there would be no stopping if you started to fall. Um, very, very steep. You can see from a couple of these pictures that um, we're at quite an angle. In fact, we had a storm rolling in at one point. We're a little nervous about that. It was a, it was a long, full day affair. But finally, we get to the top. 
And as we get to the top, um, we see some other folks there, and it's quite a, quite a bit of a celebration. Many of the peaks of France have a cross on top of them from years gone by. Uh, you can see them sometimes off in the distance. In fact, in this, in the, off in the distance, you can see the highest peak in France, or the highest peak in Europe, Mont Blanc. So we got up there and we celebrated and we enjoyed that. Um, but we couldn't deny the fact that it was indeed um, a difficult task. It was a hard task and even a dangerous task. On some of the peaks as we went along the way, you'd find great joy in that peak, bagging that peak, getting to the top, even though it was dangerous, even though it was difficult. You know, the Christian life is very often like that. There's a lot of difficulty, but we've been called to walk in a certain way through this life. There's certainly ditches on each side. There's certainly sometimes valleys on each side. There's cliffs on each side. There's danger on each side for the child of God. But we have been called to walk carefully in God's way. And so I want you to notice this from Ephesians. In Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, if you look at the outline of the book of Ephesians, we see this. The first half of the book of Ephesians is about our position in Christ. This is about what God has done. You see that there's circle the word position on your outline. It's about what God has done in making us His. Now, if you have your Bible open, look at it with me at Ephesians chapter 1 and look at verse 3. Look at verse 3 of Ephesians 1. It said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. And then what's the next phrase there? He has blessed us what? In Christ, and that's a key phrase over chapters 1, 2, and 3. It keeps saying, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And so this is for the Christian, and it's saying, he has blessed us. Look what it says in there in verse 3. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It's because we have Jesus, and Jesus is the definition of every spiritual blessing. That's who he is. Look at verse 4. Even as he chose us, there it is, in him, in Christ, in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He made us to be holy and blameless. Look at the middle of verse 4. It says, in love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with, him, with, him, with which he has blessed us again in the beloved, that's in Christ. Now, if we were to go on reading chapter one, you would see over and over and over again that it says, in Christ, in him, in Christ, in him. You see, this is our position. The believer of Jesus Christ is given a position before God. It's your standing before a holy God. It's how God views you. When God saves you and cleanses you from all of your blood guiltiness, all of your rebellion against God, he comes and he gives you a new position in him, even before you act that way. You see, there's very often that Christians don't act blameless. Christians don't act holy. Christians still struggle with the flesh. Christians still are making it through this life until we finally are with him. We have the already of being saved in Christ, but we are still waiting on the not yet of finally being with him. And so it's important for us to see this little outline. Have you ever seen an outline of a whole book of the Bible that only has two points? There it is. Number one, our position before God as followers of Christ. And what chapters does that cover? Are you paying attention? Look at your outline. What chapters does that cover? One, two, and three. Now you see below that chapters four, five, and six is number two, our practice in the world. So we have a position before God in Christ, but we have a practice. We have the way in which we are to practice our faith before the world, in the world, as followers of Christ. And that's chapters 4, 5, and 6. Now, a key word in chapters 4, 5, and 6, the last half of this little letter, is the word what? Walk. Very good. It's the word walk. So it's talking about the walk of your life. How do you carry out your Christianity? 
What, and, or how do you carry out your, the will of your heart and the will of your life? Maybe it's not Christianity. Maybe you're walking like the world. Here we see very, very powerful, a very, very powerful calling just from chapter 5, verses 1 through um, 21 that we, that we have for this challenge for our church. Now, look right up here for just a second. We would like to think that all of the Word of God is in all of our mind for all of the days of life, right? You would like to be able to go through life keeping in mind everything that God has said and living it out like that. But you know, that's just not reality for us, right? There, there's no way for us to instantly have all of the Word of God on our mind all of the time. This is why we have to study the Word. This is why we have to circle back on the Word. This is why we need to read the Word on a regular basis. We need to be fed the Word of God. We need to embed the Word of, word of God into our mind and into our heart and let it come and flow through us. So this message this morning is one of those times where we take a, a morsel of Scripture, a portion of Scripture, and we, we ingest it together, we eat it together, we study it together, and we let this Word feed us in our lives. Now, none of you remember all the meals that you've ever eaten in your life, right? You remember a few good ones. You remember, yeah, I remember Papado's in Dallas, Texas. That was pretty good. I remember uh, Rustic Inn over here um, on the other side of town. Boy, those Alaskan king crabs are pretty good. You remember a few meals here and there, but your life and your, your existence, your ongoing is everything that your mom and dad fed in and everything that you ate along the way and all the good and all the bad of that, that, that's who we've come to be. Now, this morning, we come to a glorious passage of Scripture that will challenge us to carefully walk on this path of life. I want you to see this with me. Ephesians chapter 5, chapter 5 is the section where we are, and so this is about our practice as believers and this is so on my heart for us this morning. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1 on the box on your outline says, Therefore be imitators of God. As beloved children, verse 2, and circle that next word, walk. And walk, how? In love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, that pops up later in this chapter, not in the section we're going to study this morning, but we see another time where it is the, the comparison of how Christ loved us and gave his life for us. We're studying Philippians as well in our normal study. And in Philippians, we see that Jesus came, and he did not he did not regard equality with God something to be held onto, but he left the halls of heaven. And he came, and he suffered, even suffered on a cross, for us. And so that's what we see in verse 1 and 2. We see that we're called to be an imitator of God as beloved children, verse 2, and to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now look at verse 3. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Now, the word saints is not talking about a Roman Catholic saint that would line St. Peter's um, Square. That's, that's not what we're talking about here. The Bible talks about those who are truly in Christ, those who have been forgiven or, and are following after Christ, that they have been given a position of holiness. That's what we just read in Ephesians 1 made holy and blameless. So it is proper to refer to God's children who have been saved and washed by the blood of Christ as the saints. That's who it, These are not super holy, other level Christians. That's a false understanding of saint. You all got that? that, that that's, that's from a result of religion and man-made religion. The Bible talks about those who have been redeemed by Christ as saints. And may not always look like a saint, smell like a saint, act like a saint, but we, because of our position in Christ, have been made saints. It's a very, very glorious thing. So look what he says here. He says, these things, sexual immorality sexual, or, or impurity and covetousness, must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Verse 4, 
Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking, which are, look what it says, out of place. You see, this doesn't go. That's, that's, that's bizarre. It, it doesn't belong. These are, these are out of place. End of verse 4. But instead, let there be what? Thanksgiving. So a glad heart of not, not indulging in all this stuff around you, not indulging the flesh, but living a thankful life before God. Look at verse 5. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, and that is an idolater. You see, our sins are idols. John Calvin, 500 years ago, would write, the human heart is an idol factory. Our hearts create idols. We, ought, we want to, what do you do with an idol? You worship it, right? And indeed, the human heart is made to worship, but the fallen human heart creates idols that aren't God, whereas the redeemed human heart is called to worship only God. And anything else we worship is indeed an idol. And so, notice here what it says in verse 5. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now, those are very strong words. Verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Jesus talked about the sons of disobedience. Jesus said, you don't receive my words. He looked at the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious people around him, and he said, you don't receive my words because you are of your father, the devil. If you were of my father, you would receive my words and you would obey them. But because you're not... You don't receive them. So he says, verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon them, upon the sons of disobedience. Verse 7, therefore do not become partakers with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. You see, your, your position and your identity has changed. It's not just that you were in darkness, you were darkness. He changed who you are, the characterization of who you are, the essence of who you are. And so he says in the middle of verse 8, he says, walk as children of light. Circle the word walk. It's the second time we've seen it. Look at the parentheses in verse 9. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Verse 10, so important for us in 2020. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Verse 12, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, and now he quotes a common hymn from that age. This is what we think was a, a hymn that the early church would sing, probably drawn from the book of Isaiah. It says, therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead and Christ will shine upon you. See, part of the picture here is it, it's that, that we need to wake up and see who we are in Christ. We need to wake up and see this in our, our salvation that the, the believer is called to live in Christ, awaken that. We leave behind the dead things, and as we do that, Christ shines upon us. Other important thoughts for us in 2020. Look at verse 15. Look carefully then how you what? What do I want you to do? Thank you. Circle it. Now, do you see it up in verse 2? Walk in love. Verse 8, 
walk as children of light. Verse 15, look carefully then how you walk. And here he says some things not to do. Not as unwise, but as wise. You see, godliness pursues wisdom. God is wise. God is all wise. Anything of wisdom leads to God. Anything of wisdom leads to peace. Notice this in verse 16, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. There are many people who say, well, what is God's will? What is God's will for my life? What is his will for me in this decision or in that decision? What is his will in my career? What is his will in my direction? Many young people are saying, what is God's will for my life? You, you older ones, you've already been there. You've already gone through it. You've already either figured it out or you've already made a way. I, many young Christians will often say, well, I want to obey God. I want to do what his will is. And so we see here that he says, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We're going we're to look at what that means. Verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart giving thanks always and for everything. There's that thing of giving thanks again. Verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And very interesting, verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Very quickly, I want you to notice three things from this passage. We at Sheridan Hills would do very, very well to notice that we are called to be, number one, imitators of God. I pray that as we see this passage, as we see all of the counsel of God's Word in this year, that we will be a people who seek to be imitators of God. Right out there to the side, Leviticus 19.2. In Leviticus 19.2, it's repeated in 1 Peter 3, or 1 Peter 1, it says, Be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. So we're told to imitate God. Well, what does God do? God is holy. He's set apart from a fallen world. The fallen, sinful world that we live in is is not the picture of who God is in his purity, in his holiness. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14, you can write that, 12, 14, just make that note. It says, if you do not have holiness, you will not see God. This is why we so desperately need the salvation of God in our life. This is why we must have the holiness that only Christ can give us. And if we have been given that holiness, then we are told here in Ephesians 5 to be imitators of God, to walk like God. Now, notice what it says here in verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God. And what does it say after that? As beloved children. I thought about this as I was praying over this passage. Have you ever met someone, or you you know a family, maybe it's from years ago, growing up or whatever, and you kind of know the whole crew, you know their whole family. Have you ever noticed a son or a daughter who is just like the father or just like the mother? There's some people that, we we sometimes call that a a spitting image. I just spit. A, a, sorry. A spitting image, right? He's just a spitting image of his dad. Um... You know, I think that that was more the case very often in small towns where there was different trades, either a carpenter or a farmer or somebody that, you know, um, I, I think of that in years gone by when, when I, I got to know folks in North Carolina and Georgia and, and even in Florida uh, where uh, out in the country you, life was a little bit simpler and there weren't so many influences and young man grows up in his father's house and man, he just does what his dad does. Have you ever seen that before? Kind of acts like that can still happen here in the busyness of the city, but it happens especially in more rural communities. And so th- this, this son is, is being like his dad. The son is, is, is really reflecting his dad. I, I have to say that I, I think of Brian Hughes, one of our deacons, and I think of Dylan. Um, Dylan, in a very wonderful way, is very much like his dad in a lot of ways. Works real hard, a man's man, strong, um, just ready to help. Um, it kind of has his dad's same sense of humor. God, please help us with that. But, um, <laughs> but when I look at Dylan and I look at Brian, I, 
I see this. He's, a, he's to some degree an imitator of his dad. And that's a great thing. Here we see on a much grander scale that we're called to be an imitator of our heavenly father. It's be like your dad. Be like your heavenly father who is good and holy. And look what it says. It's even a little definition on how that works. In verse 2 it says walk in love. You're to walk. See that's who God is. God is love. He says, walk in love as Christ loved us. Here's the example of God. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Here's the picture. Just as this is what God does, you do this. And so how powerful for us as a church to be challenged with this picture that in this year we are to be like God. This is what it means to be a godly person. Some of you might look at someone and say, that person is very godly. What do you mean by that? I hope you don't mean just real religious and real spiritual in that way. I hope you mean he's he's like the God of this word. This person is very godly. Or maybe you would look at this person and you'd say, this person is very ungodly. This person doesn't walk in love. This person doesn't have purity. This person is involved and and celebrates the world instead of celebrating the holiness and the goodness and the kingdom that is to come of God. And so the first thing that we would do well to remember is that we are called to walk like God. Now, the antithesis of this is verses 3 through 8. And this is where I would have you, and you see the little bracket there to help you see where this is coming out of the text. Um, This is verses three through eight, and number two is this. We are to have nothing, and this is is so clear. Look what it says in verse three. But sexual immorality and impurity or uh, covetousness, look what it says, underline this phrase, must not even be named among you. That's an extremely strong phrase saying, you have nothing to do with it. So fill this in, number two. We are to have nothing to do with sexual immorality and all impurity. Now, it's not just about sexuality. We see all impurity after that. So it can, it, your problem might not be that it's a sexual issue. Maybe you say, well, I'm, I don't really struggle with sexual immorality, but I, I really struggle with anger and hatred or I really struggle with, with racism, or I really struggle with, you know, selfishness and expectations from everyone, or maybe I really struggle with laziness, or maybe I, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I hate to name them because I'll miss yours. <laughs> so here we see we're to imitate God, but we're to have nothing to do with that. Now, quite honestly, sexual immorality is a biggie for human beings. And the reason that this is so offensive to God is because the sexuality that God made and the sexuality that God designed is really good. It's God's plan that there be one man, one woman, one lifetime. And that there be a total intimacy that is not broken by strife and not broken by selfishness and hatred. And so that we can see in an earthly relationship between two different things, a man and a woman coming together and and we see this beautiful earthly relationship so we can learn what it's like to have a relationship with God. And so when that example, that earthly example of a man and a woman coming together in order to have a family and procreate and fill the earth with God's glory, when that is broken apart or that is distorted, when that's twisted, God is highly offended by that because it distorts the perfect model that he gave us. And so this is why the the, the redefinition of marriage is anti-God. This is why our sexual immorality, you say, yeah, it's all about homosexuality, homosexuality. No, it's about adultery too. It's about fornication too. It's about every form of distortion of what God made. 
And so you say, okay, well, I'm really glad I'm not doing any of that. For those that are in that category, when I'd say, well, great. Well, what about your entertainment? Are you entertained by all of that? Because the rails are coming off on this. I mean, 532 TV programs, not TV episodes or, or, or video shows, whatever you call it. 532 ones, new ones were made, started this last year in Hollywood. And the majority of them are glorifying sexual immorality and impurity. They're often revolving around sin. You say, well, what are we supposed to watch? We'll have nothing to watch. Well, that may be okay. <laughs> I mean, that's good. You don't have to watch anything. You can have people over. You can have lost people over to your house. Show them who Jesus is by your love. You see, it's not just about doing it, but it's about glorifying it. And how we know that is it's stated in two different places in this passage. We, we see that Look at verse 5, but make sure of this, that everyone who, excuse me, the, the, here's the massive warning, so I, I don't want to forget reemphasizing this. In verse 5, it's the big thing saying, hey, some of you think you're so religious and you're so godly. Verse 5 is saying, you're not going to heaven. You're going to hell if this is what your life is like, because it shows that you're not a Christian. It shows that you're not his. And so, if you say, well, I'm a Christian, but yet I'm still struggling with this and I'm still struggling with that, I would say, well, let, let's be careful that if, you, if you're really, really dealing with that, that, that we're accurately assessing whether or not you even know the Lord. I'm not saying that you can't and struggle with sin. Christians do that. And that's the reason we have church. That's the reason we have, we have church family to help one another. That's the reason we study the Word. That's the reason we… But if all of that is not really interesting to you and you'd rather continue in your sin, here's part of the picture. It's likely you do not know the Lord. We need to think carefully about that. Look what it says here in verse 7. Therefore, do not become partakers with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light. So don't partake with it. That means don't pay for it. Look what it says down in verse 12. For it is shame, shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Well, I'm not talking about it. I'm just watching it on my TV show. Mm. You see, Christians need to be careful about what they're watching because so much of what is in the world around us is just is, is like rapid fire attack on our beliefs and on our holiness in God. I want to say this morning, as we follow after Christ, we are called to follow carefully in his truth. Now, the next part I want you to see as we close here is we are to walk. We are to walk in God's light. So we're told not to walk in darkness. We're told to have nothing to do with sexual immorality and all impurity, but we are called to walk in God's light, specifically not in darkness. Everybody look at verse 8. Look what it says. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light. Walk as children of light. Don't walk in darkness. Now, part of, the, part of the deal is, you know, the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, for you Christians, understand, yes, it is possible for you to try to go walk in darkness. If you're really Christian, that's not going to persist. But I'm just telling you, Paul's saying, don't do that. You know, that... that actually is the prescription, if you are a Christian, for misery. Because the Holy Spirit's not going to let you up on that. He's going to make it empty to you. You're going to think, oh yeah, I can get more channels, more channels, or I can go do this, or I can go do that. And you know what it does for the Christian? It just makes you more miserable. Righteousness is peaceful. Righteousness is joyful. For the Christian, unrighteousness is misery. Because you got a great big God living in your heart saying, don't do that. That's wrong. This is against me. 
And so we see he says, walk in light, not in darkness. Look at the next part here. Walk in wisdom. Walk in wisdom, not foolishness. Look down in verse 15. Do you see verse 15? Look at 15. It says, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but what? But wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Now, you say, yeah, you can say that again, pastor. The days are evil. Friends, the days have been evil for 2,000 years. We're, we're, we're in the same epic as these people. I mean, sure, there are some things that are picking up speed now, I think, especially because of technology, but let me tell you, it's always been something. Christians have always been tempted to be like the world. In every age, they've been tempted to be like the world. This is nothing new. And so Christians have always been, we're part of the ecclesia, we're part of the ones that are called out. We're called out of the world to live with God in what is true, in what is right. Now here's a beautiful part of this, and we see this, look in verse 15 what it says. Look carefully how you walk, I hope you've circled that already, carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the, most use, making the best use of the time, for the days are evil. Look at verse 17. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the, what the, will of the Lord is. Now, here's the way. Here, here's how you can know God's will. The way you know God's will is by walking in the light and walking in wisdom. When you walk in the light and you walk in wisdom, you're going to know what God wants. When you don't walk in the light and you don't walk in wisdom, but you walk in the foolishness of the world, you're going to be confused and you're going to wonder. So, if you want to know what God's will is, stay in the light and stay in wisdom. Do what he's called you to do. You can't understand the will of God if you are walking in darkness and foolishness. So young people, you say, well, I don't know what college I'm supposed to go to. I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure about that and everything else. Uh, I would just say, well, just, just really start with getting up and having your quiet time. Really start by getting up and spending devotional time with God, listening to Him, reading His Word, developing the discipline of prayer for others and for those, that are around you, for those that are around you and for your own life. And as you walk in the truth and you walk in the light of God's word, I believe part of this is you begin to see the grand plan of God's life unfold and uh, un, God's will unfold in your life. Creation, fall, redemption, glory. This is God's will. This is God's will. It's God's will that Christians share their faith so that people can be saved. That is God's will. It's God's will that people be godly and understand what his will is in this way. The last part here is very interesting. We see in verse 18, okay, verse 18, everybody look at verse 18. What's the verse 18 about? Okay, this is the big alcohol verse, right? We're Baptists. For those of you who don't realize that you're in a Baptist church, okay, and very often, you know, this is, we, we know verse 18 for one purpose, right? Um, do not get drunk with wine. There it is. For that's debauchery. But be filled with, you know, it's, it's a shame that we would allow our cultural Christianity to cause us to misunderstand the grandeur of this verse. If all this is is the don't drink verse for you, Oh, my friend, let me open a whole new beautiful world for you right now. Look what it says. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery or dissipation. That is, that is just, you're wasting everything. It's just, it's unbridled. But instead, what? Be filled with the Spirit. You see, you can either be filled with spirits that will alter you, or you can be filled with the Spirit of God. One of those two things is going to control you. Which one? Because that's what alcohol does. It'll control you. You can't, you can't control it. Especially the more you drink, the more you can't control, right? It's out of control. It's right. You can't drive. You can't control the car. You can't control your mouth. You can't control your emotions. You can't control these things. He's saying, don't go to the thing that is going to lead to destruction. And this isn't just about alcohol. It could be about a lot of other things. 
Don't be filled with sexual immorality. Don't be filled with greed. Don't be filled with all these other things. But alcohol is a really good one, as is mentioned here, because it, it, it controls you in a very obvious way. So Paul is saying to us, the Holy Spirit is saying to us, don't be filled with the things of this world that are just simply going to pass away. Be filled and controlled with the things that are forever. And how does that look? Look at verse 19 and 20. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. How different is that than an angry tirade from alcohol, right? How different is that than gambling away your savings or your paycheck because of alcohol and, and whatever? How different is that than just, you know, spending your life or ruining your marriage or ruining your children because of your own selfishness. The beautiful thing is, is that there's this sweetness that God says is so much better. Look at verse 20. Here it is again, that phrase of giving thanks. We see it for the third time here. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And look at this and submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, let me remind you that this isn't only written to individuals, but this is written to a church, the church at Ephesus. And so, this letter can be interpreted in the context for the church and for the individual in the church. And all through this, we can, we can apply that in, in both ways, in a dual purpose in, in throughout this passage. You see, if we're going to be like God and have nothing to do with sexual immorality and impurity, and if we're going to walk in God's light, walk in God's wisdom so we know God's will, we're going to need to do that in this way. Walking in God's way means, and we see this at the end of this passage, walking with God's people. The way you stay on the path of honoring God instead of honoring yourself and your flesh is don't put anything away. Hold on. Think through what I'm saying. The way you stay on the path is that you stay with God's people. This has always been God's design. In the Old Testament, it was God's design, and in the New Testament, it is God's design that God's people stay together and love one another, and we show the world in our love for one another what his love really looks like. So some of you just need to say, you know, I need to be at church more regularly. I need to be here involved with what we do because I need this input. And I'm going to just say to you, some of you guys, you just need to say, yep, when you guys talk about boot camp, I'm going to be at boot camp. When you talk about growth group, I'm going to be at growth group. When you talk about starting point, if I'm not a member of the church, I, I'm going to look at how can I be more involved with God's people? Because this is how God's people make it. We are together. And there is to be a sweetness. There's to be a worshipful nature in who we are. Friends, I want to say to you, we, need, we are called to walk carefully. The path, the path is going to be steep at times this year. For you personally, it's going to be steep. It's going to be dangerous at different points. For our culture, it's going to be steep and dangerous. Let me tell you that the devil would love to allow all the rage outside of this church to be in this church. It's part of the reason Alex Pinto's sermon last Sunday was so important, that we are to remember the unity of Christ. We're to remember the kingdom of God. This next Sunday as we pre go back to Philippians, I'm going to be talking about the glory of the majesty of the lordship of Christ. The fact that he's so much better than any power on this earth. And so, as we rally around him, as we rally around that, as we think about 2020 and stay on the path of Christ in 2020, both individually and collectively, we can seek to honor God in this life and show people what it looks like to be God's children.